a pleasure to be with you again. I don't know if anybody noticed, but uh, I want to give special thanks to the worship band. They are amazing this morning, don't you agree? And another thing, did anybody notice they played four songs? I tried to get them to play seven until about 11 o'clock so that I could just come up here and uh, offer communion and, you know, head on down, to, down the road, but it didn't work out that way. I think Julie had other plans for us today, as well as Steve. Uh, for those of you who are here to see Steve today, guess what? I'm not him. I apologize ahead of time. Uh, Steve is down in Florida. He's attending a revival down there. Um, it seems like this thing uh, had come about about seven, eight, nine months ago, whatever it was. Uh, they had heard about Steve and reached out to him that long ago. And um, so he's down there doing a revival for them, uh, doing church today and then doing evening church all the way through, I think, Wednesday. So uh, with that, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we give you thanks for this place of worship where we com comfortably sit and worship you, our Lord and Savior, safely. Uh, we pray for Steve today, Lord, as he stands before a group that he is not familiar with, Lord, but they are familiar with you, and in that common bond, may they all connect and revive their hearts and their desire to be in you, God. For Steve and me today, Lord, give the words that need to be heard from the mouths of men, from the spirit of the one and only, in your heavenly we pray, amen. All right, so the last time I was here, believe it or not, it's, it's, it's amazing how time flies. Uh, the last time I was here was February 17th of last year, almost a year ago. I know time flies, it really, really does. And it is true that as you get older, um, time does fly. The, fat, the older you get, the faster it goes. And it's all about time. I don't know if you guys saw the bulletin today, but the, uh, the label on the bulletin today is Time's Up, 0, 0.00. And I'm not going to try not to be all morbid and sad like I was last time when I was up here, but... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's all about time. You know, when we were kids, it seemed like the, when we were on summer break, the summers lasted forever, didn't it? It just, it, we just had all the time in the world. But as we get older, we start realizing that we don't. We don't have all the time in the world. When I talked to you guys before in February, the topic of my conversation was, are you ready? And that, that conversation geared towards, if you die today, would you be accepted in, in heaven? Again, uh, <laughs> This is, a, this is one of those things that uh, it's a heavy, heavy topic, and you know, it's way above my pay grade, just like I said before, and I want to make everything perfectly clear today. I am not a preacher. I've never been to preacher school, um, and certainly uh, I'm not a preacher, not after all, but not at all. So I've been asked to stand up here before you and, and, and give these words today, and, and I prayerfully approached it. Um, in fact, uh, Steve asked me a while back, and I had a to do this because, of course, he knew that he wouldn't be here today, and uh, I had a completely different topic that I wanted to talk about, and it was, it was very bright and uplifting and airy, and everybody's going to walk out of here on sunshines and rainbows, but, uh, but as life happens, um, I decided to go in a different direction after losing my brother Johnny a couple weeks ago. Uh, Sandra and, and I lost Johnny after a, a long battle. And uh, let me take a deep breath here and a drink of water so I don't start bawling like a little crybaby up here. Just like Steve. I just wish I had his, uh, his chops. But um, I certainly want to thank you, the body, for all your prayers and your cards and, and everything else. We all prayed for Johnny um, often. Uh, he certainly fought his battle. And, uh, you know, and, that's, and that's, what, that's, that's where we're at. A year ago, I talked about how, how some of us like Johnny, uh, they get to see death coming. They get to plan for it. They, they have time. Others of us, unfortunately, don't. Car wrecks, aneurysms, heart attacks, uh, all those things that are unforeseen and unplanned for. You just, people you just never really know. Um, the truth is the human body is, a, is an amazing and perfect design for sustaining life. If you think about it, it's God's perfect design. In Genesis 1.27, we read that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created man in his own image. In Genesis 2.7, we read that the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. So from dirt... Man was formed by God, and God breathed life into that form. 
So God's perfect design for sustaining life was created. Um, let's go ahead, I'm jumping right into scriptures here, I apologize for that, but going to Psalms 139, Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So, as we were being formed in our mother's womb, God knew us already. He gave us this body to sustain our life. Our skin protects us from radiation and infection. Our skeleton is designed, not only keeps us upright, but also supports and protects our vital organs. Our hair, at least some of us that have it, has... <laughs> you, Steve, I'm talking to you. Our hair, at least some of us who have it, has a purpose, especially our eyebrows and our eyelashes, even the hairs in our nostrils. Again, some of us more than others. Uh, <laughs> and ear, 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 that ear hair thing, it just gets me. I, I don't know. I don't, that's one I don't get, man. I get like one big long one that comes out and yank it, but yeah. Okay, I digress. Let me get back on, on track here. Because this can go south really, really quick, so I've got to stay on point here. Stay on message. Those of you who know me know that I can get lost really, really, really quick. So your eyebrows and your eyelashes, they're, they're a perfect design to keep debris out of your eyes and particulates, and, the, and your nose hairs, believe it or not, have a, have a purpose of keeping particulates out of your sinuses. God's perfect, perfect design for us. You know, we don't tell our bodies to breathe. It just, it just does. It's driven by a wonderful brain that communicates with our entire body. Uh, have you ever tried to hold your breath either in or out of water? I mean, I've tried it. Just to do a, you know, when you're kids, you do this, uh, I'm going to hold my breath longer than you contest. And eventually, you, don't have, you can't help it. You have to breathe. At some point, your body takes over and you just gasp for breath. breath. Uh, for that life-giving, you just can't help it. You don't tell your heart beat heart to beat. It just does. It's God's perfect design. You don't have to tell your eyes to blink to cleanse your eyeballs. It just happens. All part of grand design of the human body. You know, I, had a, I have a nephew, uh, my brother Jeff's son, Jeffy. He obviously learned about involuntary muscle movement in school one day, and uh, because he was, uh, we were at, the, at my mom and dad's house together, and, and Jeff, he was doing, like, blinking his eyes really, really deliberately and hard, and you know, he's a little kid, I don't know how old he was, and I asked my brother Jeff, I said, what's wrong with your kid, man? <laughs> I mean, is he, that's how we talk to each other, what's wrong with that kid? Uh, so I asked him, I said, what's, what's wrong with him? He says, I don't, he learned something in school about into, involuntary muscle movement, how your body just does things that, you know, it just does. It blinks, your eyes blink, you know, you, you don't know how, when you blink your eyes, it doesn't even affect your vision. But this kid was like, and I'm like, what's wrong with him? Is he, is he something bad happening with him? And he said, no, he was taught about involuntary muscle movement and he got in his head that he now has to tell his eyes to blink. You know, and that literally it was that deliberate, like, like this all day long. I'm like, he finally stopped, thankfully. I guess he got exhausted or whatever. I mean, it, it was the strangest things, but, you know, you, it just, all of that stuff just happens naturally. I mean, it's God's perfect design. I bring all this up because of, because of Johnny. Uh, for those of you who don't know my brother, I know there's, there's a lot of new faces here, and I certainly welcome you to Branches of Christ. I, I hope you enjoy it as much as, as we do um, and, and certainly want to come back. But for those of you... Who don't know Johnny? Eleven years ago, he uh, he suffered an aortic dissection in his heart in his aorta. Uh, I guess that's where it would be because you only have one aorta and you only have one heart. So there you go. But he had an aortic dissection in his heart that he lost his blood flow inside of his body, that uh, basically paralyzed him from the from the sternum down. Another part of that whole st story was is that in order to get him stabilized, they had to put him into a drug induced coma for several months while they got things under control and figured out how they were going to basically save his life. And it was during that time, in my, the last time I talked to you all, uh, in, the, on, in February 17th, that uh, the do you ready thing, are you prepared? When Johnny came out of that coma, he was very, very afraid. He was scared. And if you, 
if you can think about being in a drug-induced coma, of course, yeah, there was probably some drugs involved and some, you know, some psychedelic stuff going on. But it was also the things he saw and what I took from that and what Steve took from that is that when he woke, he had a message from God to tell everybody. And that was, you do not want to go to hell. Because Johnny actually, while he was in his coma, I firmly believe that he saw a glimpse of hell and was able to live through it and warn us about it. So there are many things that could have gone wrong with that whole thing to Johnny, but he woke up, uh, he was paralyzed from the, from the, basically from here down, and, uh, but apparently God wasn't done with him yet. Um, the life expectancy of somebody in Johnny's condition, according to the doctors, was around five to seven years. Um, but again, God wasn't done with him yet. As I told you earlier, he lived 11. He lived 11 through it now. Were they awesome, wonderful times? If you asked Johnny, he would say, yeah. He was breathing. He was alive. He got to talk to his family. Um, Johnny lived vibrantly and purposefully every, every day. He rediscovered Christ, and he was actually baptized at a church that, strangely enough, popped up right around the corner from his house in a strip mall, very similar to the old branches of Christ, literally right around the corner. It was so close to Johnny that he was able to drive his wheelchair down there, and that's what he looked like, you know. <laughs> Uh, his little power chair down there. He was able to drive that down there to church and attend church. The beauty, beautiful part of that whole thing was is that my sisters also started attending with Johnny. Um, you know, it was, just a, it was just an amazing, amazing thing. And I firmly believe that that was part of grand, God's grand design for Johnny. I came through one day. I was traveling, and um, I knew that he was probably getting out of church or getting close to it. I missed church. I tried to get there. And I was, I was traveling in town, and I went ahead and pulled into his neighborhood, and what do I see going down the sidewalk is Johnny <laughs> leaving church. So I pulled my cell phone out, and I started videotaping, and all I heard in my head was, dun 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 The lady on the bicycle in the Wizard of Oz. But, and every time I see him in that wheelchair, because his head kind of vibrates around like this, you know, because he's paralyzed from the waist down, he can't really hold himself up too good. But uh, that's all I think about was that church and that pop-up and the video and the pictures that we saw of, of him and the preparation that that church had to make to baptize a paralyzed man. This was not a church that was developed for being a church. It was probably a, a shirt shop or something. I don't know, you know, whatever. But they brought in a swim pool. They had a team of people. Um, and they were able to get Johnny in and, and cleanse him in the water of Christ. And, and he came back out, baptized. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's go to Acts 17, please. At 24, we read, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men. From Adam he made every nation of men. That they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time for them and set the exact places where they should live. Going back to this church that popped up in Johnny's neighborhood. Divine intervention? I think so. Continuing on, Blake. Brooke, excuse me. God did this so that men would seek him. If we allow God to direct us, he will lead us to where we can seek him. He will put people in our paths. He will put churches up around the corner. If you just open your mind and open your heart, God is there. And his grand design is for you to seek him. He wants us all to seek him. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for everybody to find him so that we can be carried to heaven. So God did this so men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's never far from each of us. What does that mean, he's never far from each of us? He's right there. He's always right there, reading on. For in him we live and move and have our being. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of our poets have said, we are his offspring. God places us if we let him. My wife and I joined this church about 19 years ago. There was a uh, friend of ours in our neighborhood. Her name was Vicki. 
she, uh, she passed away from an aneurysm quite suddenly. She died on Good Friday. There was a, uh, there was a funeral, obviously, and, and we, of course, attended. And at that funeral was my, myself, Chris, and Johnny, my brother Johnny. We attended this funeral, and, um, you know, it was in, in Woodstock. And there was this guy there that was uh, in cowboy boots, jeans, blazer, you know, and he's got this little, hey, what's going on, attitude, you know, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm cool, and it was Steve. <laughs> it was Steve, and the reason that uh, Steve was kind of approached Johnny and I, you know, Johnny and Steve had an instant, you know, attraction to each other, for lack of a better term, because I think that, I think that Steve appreciated Johnny's bluntness and his, <laughs> and his, just who he was, and of course, Johnny was, you know, why is this, why is this guy talking to me? Why is this guy, why, who's this guy to talk to me? And all Steve was trying to do is find out a little bit more about Vicky because it, you know, they were new to the church as well, and he had been asked to do the funeral, so there he was. But that was 19 years ago. That following Sunday, we, talk, you know, we talked to Steve. Steve did a great job at that funeral. And so we talked to Steve, and, and, um, and he said, look, where's your, you know, like everybody does when they're all emotionally engaged in the funeral and everybody's crying and you know, you know, they're in a better place and all this other kind of stuff. Um, you know, you get caught up in it for a minute, and, you know, of course, we asked, where's, where's your church? He said, over on 92, old 92 by 75. So we decided we were going to go that Sunday and hear the, hear the rest of Steve's message. Well, it was in the strip mall down the road, and I don't know if anybody has seen it, but from the time we left it, it was 100% better than the time we first saw it 90, 19 years ago. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We literally sat outside, Chris, Johnny, and I sat outside in the car, and we were like, I'm not going in. Are you going in? <laughs> you know, it was literally like that. It was that bad that we were, we were freaking out. We were like, look, this is not a, a, it's not a church. It's something else. And what's all these boats doing in the parking lot? You know, is it a church slash boat sales or what? So we sat there and we debated back and forth. And I think it was Johnny that said, the heck with it. We're here. Let's go. Let's go in. So we go in and we're, of course, not quite on time because that just happened to be daylight savings time that weekend. So we weren't an hour late, don't, <laughs> come on now, it wasn't that bad, it was a few minutes late, but our, the guy that we were going there to support, Mark Shalana, the husband of Vicky, the one who died, he did not reset his clock, so he was an hour late. And uh, so Chris, Johnny, and I go, so we sneak in the back door and we grab the first three seats in the back row that we could find, and we're looking around for snakes, like, are there any snakes in here? Because we don't like snakes. So we sat there, we sat down, we get comfortable. And then, you know, the, the message starts, the band played, the message started. And uh, about an hour later, Mark walks in. He walks in, I think the other door is what it was. I don't remember exactly. Steve stops his sermon. He goes, Mark, they're over there. And he said, and so Mark comes around, sits down with us. And we, of course, we razzed him because he was late. So we really enjoyed that first time. I'm getting totally off message here. I apologize. But we, we really enjoyed that first time at that church, and uh, we went back the following Sunday. I think Johnny had to go back to St. Louis to travel or whatever, and I think we went three Sundays in a row, as I believe, and then we missed a, missed a Sunday, and we got a phone call. Hey, Joe, it's Steve. Oh, the preachers, Chris, we're in trouble. We, I don't know what we got ourselves into here, but, and I said, hey, Steve, how are you? He said, I'm good. And uh, he goes, uh, did, is, are you, did something happen? Is, we missed you today. I'm, I'm looking at Chris going, this is, this is not going to work out. <laughs> I missed, you know, I went three Sundays in a row, and now I'm, uh, now I'm getting called to come on back. But let me tell you something. That was probably the best phone call that I could ever happen to my wife and I. Because we mattered. We mattered to somebody that mattered to God. And that was the beginning of our lives changing completely. Not quickly, not overnight. We, it, it was a slow roll, baby. And, uh, you know, and, and most, there's a lot of people here that were there then. And I appreciate you very much, and I appreciate you listening in today. So God places us if we let him, where we cross a path and will steer us towards him. That's all that God wants. He doesn't want us to believe in him. He wants us to believe him. Believing in something is not the same as believing something, okay? And to me, that's where I want to be in, in my heart is I want to believe. If what this Bible tells me, I believe is the truth. I believe that God sent his son to this earth to save us. 
And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for us and he rose again. I believe that firmly. So here's Johnny. Back to Johnny. Sorry about that. Here's Johnny paralyzed. Wakes up from, from his thing. Talks to Steve. Steve comes up, talks to him, talks to all of us. He's paralyzed. He's in a wheelchair. And his first task was to start working on his truck so he could drive it. A paralyzed man started making phone calls, got his truck outfitted with a, with a lift to lift his chair into the truck, got hand steering, got all this and got all that. And the reason he did that is because he already knew that this was his new normal. It wasn't poor, poor, pitiful Johnny Everett, because he could be like that. You talk about a snot-blowing guy, bubble-blowing, you know, big old baby snot-blower. He would, he would pout with the best of them. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Bad visual. You guys know the little babies when they cry in a little, right? <laughs> so everybody has seen that at some point in time, right? That's just me. Okay, good. But anyway, somebody's running to the bathroom to be sick. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, he was he could he could have he was he could have pity on himself for sure, but not this time. Not the way he came out of this thing. So he started working on it. He's, and that's the way he described it. Joe, this is the hand I was dealt. This is my new normal. This is what I had to deal with. And every time something else happened, you would talk to him and he would say, Just part of the game, bro. But I gotta keep rolling, gotta keep going. I'm not gonna give up. These are the cards I've been dealt, was, his, was one of his favorite sayings, and I will figure it out. Frankly, as I said, this mentality of Johnny's floored us all. We never, nobody that knew Johnny. Right, Dan? Nobody that knew Johnny would have thought that he would be the person that he turned out to be. Strong. Will, his will to live, his will to, to just do and his will to continue being who Johnny was a lot of times, which didn't work out for him in, in a lot of cases. So over time, this is, the, this is where it kind of started going downhill. And, and this is how I want you to know who my brother is. He developed a sore on his foot from his wheelchair, and they noticed that the sore wasn't healing. It just, it just wouldn't heal. He went back for several surgeries, and they cleaned it out. They got rid of the infection. They did this. They did that. And uh, it just wouldn't heal. It just wouldn't heal. It was a nasty, nasty thing. Um, so the doctors came in, and they were like, like look, John, I said, He's, you know, we're gonna, we need to remove that foot. And the best thing to do to make sure we get all the infection that's in there is to remove your leg below the knee. And Johnny thought about it, and he pondered, as Steve said at his funeral the other day. Johnny was a ponderer, a thinker. Johnny says, well, no, we're not going to do that. If we're going to take something off, let's take it off as high as you can take it off. Doctor's like, why? Why do you want to do that? It makes me lighter. So when I transfer, I got less weight to deal with. I don't want a stub hanging out there. Just take it off. And that's exactly the reaction that you just had was the doctor's reaction. Really? Yeah, take it off. Take it off as high as you can. I don't need it, you know. So the doctors looked at each other like, okay, let's take it off. So they did. Sorry about that. They took it off as high as they could to, to lighten Johnny's load, and he, was, and he was happy with that. So the degradation continued, and then fight as Johnny might, Johnny's body slowly began to fail him. Uh, he, could not, he, wouldn't, he, he wouldn't give up. Just as he, you know, when you're in that position that none of us know what we would do, just like we were all surprised at how Johnny's reaction was. None of us really know what, how we would react if we were in that position. We like to think we'd be strong and, you know, I, I can take care of that. You know, I'm not worried about any of that. I, it's, it's all good for me. But, uh, you know, just as easily, people can turn from God in those circumstances. Easily. In fact, I have, I'm not going to mention any name, but I have somebody that's very, very near and dear to me. Very near and dear to me that lost several family members just due to freak accidents. Just the freakiest thing you'd ever want to, I mean, just weird stuff. He was raised in a very Christian home. And over, through all of these trials and tribulations, he just turned his back on God. He just doesn't, he doesn't believe. He doesn't know what to believe, in fact. He's in a, he's in a, in a purgatory. He's in nowhere. So we pray for him, as, of course. Um... We don't know what God's motives are for, for that, but, you know, he's, we have the Bible that tells us. Let's go ahead and go to 1 Peter 2.19, please. 
Let me find 1 Peter 2.19. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because of his consciousness of God. It is, it is commendable for a man to hold up under the pain. Let's go ahead and go, Brooke, to 2 Corinthians, please, starting in chapter 4. Did I not mark that down? Hold on, I'm lost. My bad. All right. We read. I think I'm in the wrong place here. Second Corinthians chapter, starting in chapter four. That doesn't look right. Oh, I'm in First Corinthians. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. My bad. Okay, that's why. At least I caught it. And didn't start reading something that didn't match the screen. I mean, come on, give me a break. So this this whole chapter um, in in the Bible is called Treasures in Jars of Clay. And as I mentioned, and I knew there was a tie in here. Um, in Genesis, we read that we were formed from dust. And from, you know, the same dust that makes pots, pottery, jars of clay. So therefore, since, God mercy, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We, and this is Paul. Paul is talking to the church of Corinth. Uh, they, had, they had strayed away from the word. And uh, so this is Paul, Paul's ministry to the church of Corinth. Um, Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, we set forth, on the contrary, we, on the contrary by setting forth the truth, plainly we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the, and the glory of Christ, who is the in, image of God. So the little G, is that back up, Brooke? Did, did we lose it? Anyway, in the Bible, it's uh, the, the God of this age, and it's a little G in your Bible. The God of this age is Satan. Satan is the one who rules the earth. The God of this age has blinded the, the minds of the unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel. And the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, for God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure. We have this treasure. In jars of clay to show that the, this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The treasure is, you know, jars of clay were used to hold like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found them in, I think it was 1947, something like that, 1945. Some, some more scrolls that were hidden in jars of clay. Um, but in, in this particular passage, the, 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 the treasure that is, that's in our jar of clay, which is our human body, the treasure is the Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus. Okay, that's the treasure that we are, that we get to carry around once we accept him in our lives. That is an amazing, amazing gift. Our bodies, you know, our bodies like pottery come in all shapes and sizes as well. But we have this treasure in jars of clay that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. As a, as a pottery pot, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Why? Because we have Christ in our lives. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. We carry around. We know the story. We, we've, we've learned what this Bible tells us about the life of Christ, that God gave us his son. So we carry that around with us so that Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive 
are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may reveal, be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is, not, is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I'm going to jump ahead to 16 here if you don't mind. Therefore, thank you, Brooke. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. As our bodies degrade, as we age, we are, people, we are wasting away a little bit at a time. But, in our, but we are being renewed day by day because of our belief in Christ. For our light and our momentary troubles, our light and momentary troubles, they're light and they're momentary. Troubles are not permanent as long as you have Him. They're light and they're momentary. If we remember that, we'll be a much happier people. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Far outweighs what? What are we talking about here? Far outweighs them all. The troubles. They're outweighed, far outweighs the troubles. that any, any troubles that can come your way can be outweighed by the love of Christ, the Holy Spirit working in you, God. So we fix our eyes on what is seen. We, we, we fix our eyes not on what is seen. Excuse me, that's a very important word. One little, three little word can make a big difference. Not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is is eternal it's called faith faith you can't see it you can't touch it but you can believe it johnny just like any of us could have turned his back on god and dwelled in self-pity but he didn't because people it's in the low points of your life the low points that you must decide what you believe we must decide to trust God that he has everything under control and knows us and what we are going through. And it is at this point, our lowest point, that we grab a hold and we don't let go. No matter what is going on in our lives, the Father, he, he allows us to hang on. He'll get us through it. We need to hang on as though our life depends on it because it does. Our lives depend on it. I'm sorry. It's, I get aggravated sometimes with myself. Johnny's gyroclade began to break down after 11 years. Thankfully for us, in September of this year, all the family got together and we had a fish fry. We planned on having a fish fry for a long time and schedules got in the way and things started happening and People, Johnny, said, hey, guys, we might want to get together. Oh, we'll get together for Thanksgiving. Johnny's like, no, let's not wait till Thanksgiving. He knew. He knew what was going on. We all got together with him. He was in his wheelchair. He was just darting around all over the place, and I tell you what, he loved it. He loved it. He loved it that we saw him not as a dying man, but as Johnny, because, you know, we... If you guys ever seen a fish fry, you got this big old skillet full of grease. And you got your crappie and your bass. No catfish, no, but some people don't like catfish. And you got this propane tank sitting on the ground, and you got an open flame everywhere and grease everywhere. So here's Johnny going around, making sure everything, you know, checking all the safety, taking safety readings on everything, making sure his house doesn't get burned down. I got pictures of him. Every five minutes, he's like, is that, is that thing stable? Is that all right? You go over here and look again. But we had this fish fry, and uh, he, had thought that he had thought it through. He wanted, he, this is how he wanted everybody to remember him. And as we sat down to eat our fish and our hush puppies and our french fries, we, uh, Johnny kind of pulled into the middle of our circle there, and he goes, I know you guys probably want to pray, but I, want, I have something that I want to say. So he pulled in there, and he stumbled around a little bit, and Lit another cigarette. <laughs> Off of a cigarette, I think. And uh, because once he found out he was terminal, he was like, I'm going to smoke. I'm, I'm, I'm a smoker. I'm going to smoke. So he lit a cigarette. He told us that day that he loves waking up every morning. 
He loves the life, that, the extended life that God gave him after he dissected. He knew he was only supposed to live a short time, five to seven years at best, but he lived 11, and he knew that every day was a gift. Just like when we wake up healthy as we are today, we should thank God for the gift of this day. Because he recognized that in that moment, he could see it coming. His time was up, almost. It was coming. So he told the family, look, I know that everybody's sad. He goes, but I'm ready. I, I am ready to go. I want to see my mom and dad. I want to see my sisters, my brother. He goes, I'll be the baby on the other side. But that's what, that's what I'm looking forward to. And then there were five in the Everett family. Because we certainly have had our losses, as I'm sure most of you have as well. He wanted us to see him upright and interactive because he knew it was getting close to the end. And he really did. He, Johnny was a realist. There was, no, there was no bones about it. He was a realist. That was in September. So the Thanksgiving that we were supposed to have as a family, including Johnny, it, it's Sandra and Tom and Chris and I decided not to go up there because we knew that Johnny wasn't going to be at Thanksgiving dinner. So we stayed home. We did our own thing, and uh, Steve and Julie decided that they, I think it was Steve's turn for his family, and Steve and Julie decided that they were going to go up to Steve's parents' house for Thanksgiving dinner. It was planned. And Steve, believe it or not, grew up just north of where we grew up at. He was in Illinois. He was in the farm boy, and we were the cool people, so <laughs> just saying. Um, but he wasn't, he really didn't grow far. He had to, they had to go through the St. Louis metropolitan area to get to Steve's house. And I just, I just dropped a little bug in Steve's ear sometime down the road. I said, hey, man, if you guys are going up there, and if you have time, why don't you pop in on Johnny? I'm sure he would love to see you. And maybe do his last rites or his confessional, whatever Johnny needed from his... What's that? He, he, John, he, Johnny always said that Steve, has, uh, Steve was connected, like a mafioso or something. Steve was... <laughs> Steve, you're connected with God, right? Yeah, we all know you're connected, Steve. So, and, and, Steve, and Steve literally was, you know, Johnny's guy. He was not just his preacher, he was his friend. Steve and Julie stopped by. They left Atlanta, heading to Steve's house, which I'm sure he was tickled, just excited as all get out to go see his parents. But they took the time to detour, go around, and see Johnny. They didn't call him. They didn't call ahead. They didn't, you know, they wanted, to, they wanted to literally surprise him. So they got to Johnny's neighborhood and pulled into Johnny's driveway. Of course, you know, what, it would have taken me nine hours to get to Johnny. It probably took Steve seven and a half. But, uh, but after that long drive, they pulled into the driveway and... Uh, Johnny didn't recognize the car. Johnny never seen, seen Steve's car before. He didn't recognize it. So <laughs> Steve gets out of the car, and he looks, he looks in Johnny's garage. Johnny's got a couple of guys in there. And all he hears Johnny say was, look, there's my preacher now. And the people that Johnny was talking to that had him cornered in his garage turned around and looked, and here comes Steve and Julie walking up. And I, they, whatever they did, they said their pleasantries, they turned around and walked away. And I'm sure that words were exchanged, but they were Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> they were literally had Johnny. Johnny was in his, was in his garage smoking, and they, these Jehovah's Witnesses drove by, and they saw Johnny in his garage. Here's a, here's a soul we need to save. So in they go. They're in there talking to Johnny. And Steve Pettit and Julie Pettit pull up at that very moment. <laughs> Can you believe it? Talk about God's timing. They drove all the way from Atlanta Probably got lost a couple times getting to Johnny's house. And at that exact moment, they pulled up in Johnny's driveway. Is that incredible? Let's look at what incredible means according to Mr. Webster. I looked it up. Because it is incredible when you think about it. If you thought, if you thought of this story outside of God, it would be incredible. So incredible according to Mr. Webster means too extraordinary or improbable to be believed. That's what it means. Hard to believe. 
so incredible? No. That trip was ordained by God. I believe it. I believe that if you have an open heart to receive the messages that God is giving you, He will steer you in the path that you need to be on. They had a great visit. They took pictures. I think Julie said that, that Johnny was Johnny. You know, he was in his chair. His body was degrading. He was getting thinner and thinner. He wasn't eating as much. He was starting to take some medicine that needed to be taken. So right after that, um, it was decided that Johnny and Nancy, his lovely wife, decided that it was time to go on hospice. To start, start taking the medicine because Johnny was in pain. Johnny was in pain because the same sore that he had on his foot that they removed his leg about was now happening to other parts of his body. Pressure sores, they call them. And they wouldn't heal. They wouldn't heal. It was just, it was said by the doctors and by the hospice nurses that had Johnny not been paralyzed, the pain would have been unbearable. But he was. He was paralyzed. He didn't feel it. So they decided that that was the best, that was time. And uh, when, this, when, they, when the decision was made, the condition that Johnny was in, the hospice people told the family, Sandra, myself, and the rest of the family, that Johnny had six to ten days to live. He was terminal. Johnny had his struggles. Uh, he was in and out of a consciousness and awareness. In fact, I was talking to Nancy one day on the phone. I called her often. Not to see how Johnny was doing, to see how she was doing. Doesn't make me a wonderful person. But just think about that. Your husband lay dying in his, in his bedroom. So I called Nancy just to see how she was doing. And she told me, she goes, Joey, you guys are not allowed to call me Joey, by the way. My, I, should, I let that slip, my bad. <laughs> I cannot believe that just came out of my mouth. <laughs> I'm telling you, write that down. You can't call me Joey. But, uh, but she says, she goes, when I went to bed last night, she goes, I thought for sure I'd wake up this morning and Johnny would be gone. She goes, he had a very bad day. He had a very bad night. He was working. He was writhing. He was obviously in pain, so they just keep giving him the, giving him the morphine. So she woke up. She said, I woke up, and I listened for a little bit, and she goes, I didn't hear anything. And um, I got up, and I went into Johnny's room, and he said, good morning. She's like, he was like this in his bed. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, really? Good morning. She goes, yeah, totally, total opposite of where he was at last night. She goes, I have no idea what he's fighting for or what he's waiting for, but he had a good day. He had a good day. A couple days later, my brother Jeff went by to see him, and we got to FaceTime each other. Jeff, Johnny, and myself, he FaceTimed him. And as soon as, you know, John, Johnny had a little trouble focusing on the, on the iPhone, and Jeff was kind of putting it in front of him, and then I saw Johnny, Johnny saw me, and he wasted no time insulting me. Not, not, not a lick. Well, looky there. I can't tell you what he says about the size of my head, but he made, a, he made a, his normal comment about the size of my head. Speaking of which, Steve, if you're, if you're dialing in, this thing's stretched out. You might as well buy a new one. It's, 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 I, I, my brain is being cut off from circulation as we speak. I can't feel my ears. Uh, so anyway, but <laughs> he never wasted a moment. He didn't, he didn't miss a lick insulting his little brother. Typical Johnny, and I will hold that dear to my heart for as long as I live. He kept fighting, and he kept working. In his delirium, he was asking for a sketch pad. He was barking orders at people trying to put shot blast machines together because Johnny and I worked together for many years. He was still working. Was he, was he checking off the list of things he left undone? I don't know. But in, in one of his days that he was actually awake and talking, he, he was so mad at somebody that he says, well, I'm just gonna, I just need to call my brother-in-law Kenny because Kenny will get it done because Kenny always was up there helping Johnny. So he knew that Kenny would be there to help him. What a man. On the morning that Johnny died, three weeks ago, he asked Nancy, he, he, she was in there, and she's, Johnny, do you need anything? And she says, and Johnny said to Nancy, is it okay if I die today? 
checked. Is everything in order? And Nancy said, yeah, Johnny. Yeah, all the plans are in place. Everything is as we discussed it. And you can do what you need to do. He died at 4.15 in the afternoon that day. This was two months after we were told that he was going to only live six to ten days. Johnny made it through Christmas. Johnny got to see the year 2020. He died one week before his 64th birthday. Four years ago, Johnny gave me a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper was everything that he wanted done for his funeral. Four songs. Steve Pettit. Bold. Um, And just... He wanted everything to be happy. He wanted it to be a happy, happy, happy thing. Of course, funerals are not hardly ever happy, but this one was was particularly good. I want to tell you a little bit of something about your preacher. He and his preacher's wife. He had a wedding to do. Johnny's funeral was on Friday. And Steve, of course, was going to do Johnny's funeral because that was Johnny's wishes. I asked Steve and Julie if they could get me the name of the bride that was getting married that weekend because Julie had to cover for Steve at the, at the wedding rehearsal. Now, any of you young ladies that aren't currently married, I want, you to, I want you to put yourself in that young lady's spot when your minister who is to marry you tells you that he's going to go do a funeral in St. Louis, and he won't be able to make your rehearsal. And I told Steve, I sent Steve a message. I said, Steve, there's ice coming in. You can bail, buddy. We can, we'll, we'll cover it. Your call. The message I got back was, God's got this. God's got this. That was the only response I got back. I was traveling. I met Steve. Chris and my daughter Alex at the airport we all we scheduled it so we'd all get there together we watched the weather and uh it was it was touch and go for a while the weather on Friday was horrible Steve had to fly home Saturday in order to do this young lady's wedding and he did he made it in fact the plane was 15 minutes early amen prayer and just the belief that God has this if you believe steve did the funeral for my family and he did a great job but afterwards i told him i told steve that he never misses an opportunity to preach the word even to probably a room full 50 percent of non-believers he talked he we laughed steve cracked himself up one time that was just like really dude I mean, it was, my daughter made the comment that me, Chris, and Sander, and Tom, th- those that really knew Steve were the only ones laughing in the room because everybody else was like, what is going on with this guy? He was talking about Jesus spitting in some blind guy's eye, and he cracked himself up. I mean, he literally cracked, you know, that big belly laugh that Steve does. He, cra- he was cracking himself up, and everybody else is kind of like, what the, what's going on? <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was fantastic. So Johnny had it all laid out. He knew exactly what he wanted. The songs were perfect. It was, it was all good. You know, and everybody writes things in the eulogy, but I have to, I have to mention Mark Shalana right now because he, he described Johnny, Johnny's the best. He said in the, uh, on the website for the funeral home that once Johnny cowboyed into your life, you never forgot him. And that's the truth. Thank you, Mark, for that, for that comment because it was spot on. Johnny taught us all lessons in perseverance, and we will miss him. So, I apologize to those of you today that, that came to church for, for a God message. I hope you maybe received one. And me talking about Johnny, my brother, another funeral, I guess, per se. I know my wife didn't, didn't want me to be all down and sad and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? Life steers us in the directions that we go. And I felt compelled to share this story with you, not only because he's my brother, but because how God interacted in this whole thing with myself and Chris and Steve and Julie and Johnny and the whole, the whole domino effect that happens 
if you just go where God leads you and you listen to what God has to say. JG, if you'll get your team up here. I meant to finish way earlier. I'm so, so sorry, guys. Um, I'm, I don't think I'm late. but So to close, as, as you guys come up, time's up. If you look at your bulletin, time is up. When our life clock runs out and God decides to call us home and we don't have any more opportunity to welcome God into our lives, that's it. We don't have any other time to do it. So I suggest that you look deep in your hearts and if you have not invited, invited Christ into your lives, that you do so sooner than later. For those of you who know me, you guys know that I love the daily bread and I read it every day. I just don't share where I read it at. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I apologize. And strangely enough, on Tuesday, January the 14th, the, uh, the title of the, on the daily bread, and by the way, these are free in the lobby. If anybody ever wants to get one, they are just an awesome inspiration, a good way to start your day. And speaking of free... Those of you who don't own a Bible, there is a Bible underneath your chair in front of you. It's yours to take if you would like to take it home. We'll replace it. We want everybody in our church to own a Bible. Slowing down time. A lot has changed since the electric clock was invented in the 1840s. We now keep time on smartwatches, smartphones, and laptops. The entire pace of life seems, to, seems faster, and even our leisurely walking is speeding up. This is especially true in cities and can have a negative effect on health, scholars say. We're just moving faster and faster and getting back to people as quickly as we can. That's driving us to think that everything has to happen now. Moses, the writer of one of the oldest of the Bible's Psalms, reflected on time. He reminds us that God controls life, life's pace. We don't. God controls life's pace. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night, he wrote. The secret to time management, therefore, isn't to go faster or slower. It's to abide in God, spending more time with Him. Then we get in step with each other, but first with Him. The one who formed us and knows our purpose and plans. Get in step with God because He knows where you need to be and where you need to go. Our time on our earth won't last forever. We can manage it wisely, not by watching the clock, by giving each day to God. As Moses said, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Then, with God, we'll always be on time, now and forever. So I offer this to you. For those of you who have, who have accepted Christ, do yourself and your family a favor. Tell them that you are saved and look forward to the kingdom of heaven. Don't leave any regrets behind. Mend those broken fences and take the lead in doing so. Tell those you love that you love them. And remember that funerals are not for the living, are, are for the living and not for the dead. Funerals are for the living and not for the dead because the dead have already passed. And their time is up. Please stand.